neuroplasticity after a stroke is actually a thing. And this, this myth that there is a plateau after which your brain cannot recover is, is a myth. It's completely false. The brain has the ability to recover, reorganize function with repeated practice. The scientific community is completely convinced that neuroplasticity is a thing. What we have not yet fully convinced are the neurologists and the funders, the payers. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello once again and welcome to the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your stroke experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that it will help somebody else who's going through something similar. If you are a researcher who wants to share the findings of a recent study, or you are looking to recruit people into studies, you may also wish to reach out and be a guest on my show. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to supporting stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the contact form, explaining briefly which category you belong to and I will respond with more details about how we can connect via Zoom. Now this is episode 269 and my guest today is Dr. Swathi Kiran who is the founding director of the Center for Brain Recovery where the focus is to detect and identify neurological disorders early, understand the mechanisms underlying the disease, evaluate which treatments work for which patients and enable success in the real world. Dr. Swathi Kiran, welcome to the podcast. Sounds Hi there, Bill. It's really lovely to have you here uh, because one of the things that I do that some people don't know that I do is every once in a while, I get together with a uh, group of stroke survivors who have aphasia. And as somebody who's a stroke survivor who doesn't have aphasia, it's still very difficult and complicated for me to understand how to support people like that and to understand the complex nature of the condition. And it seems like it's a really difficult and challenging condition and probably one of the most challenging conditions because if I'm considering it from my perspective, not being able to have my voice or the fluidity of my voice, I I think would be quite the challenge that I would seriously want to overcome. Tell me a little bit about your background and how you got to be in the role that you're in and what your current role is. Uh, Bill, uh, my Current title is um, the James and Cecilia Ying Professor of Neuro Rehabilitation. Um, and I'm also the founding director of the Center for Brain Recovery. So I think my both my titles um, explain what I do. I study brain recovery and I'm specifically focused on neuro rehabilitation. Um, I've been doing this work for the last... 25 years or more. Um, and my main goal is to harness what we know about neuroplasticity, especially after somebody has a stroke. And my area of focus, as you pointed out, is to study people who have had a stroke in the left hemisphere, um, which is the part of the brain that is involved in language processing. Sometimes you have a stroke in the right hemisphere, but most of the people I work with have had a stroke in the left hemisphere and they end up having aphasia. So over the last 25 years, I've spent most of my research work focused on understanding whether we can help people who've had a stroke and and how well we can capitalize on that both 
by understanding neuroplasticity and I'm using data science and machine learning more recently. Okay. I am just remembered something. My niece, who's currently studying um, at uni, she's just decided to uh, go into speech therapy. Um, she's mm. going to focus her work in, in speech therapy. And I said to her, Renee, you know how there's some people who have aphasia who can't speak properly, but they can sing. Why can they sing, but they can't speak properly? Why can't we use the singing part of the brain to switch on the talking part of the brain or to transfer it with neuroplasticity to that part of the brain? And she came up with a answer, which was um, that it's a completely different part of the brain and it's in a different side of the brain or some different location from the um, speech center. And then that is where the diff difficulty lies, where the um, challenge is to sort of bridge that gap and convert one part of the brain to a different function or, or to an added function. Is that familiar? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, your Bill, your niece is a very smart person. She, I think, has already learned what is, I think, the most important thing in terms of the anatomy and the neurophysiology of what the brain can and cannot do uh, as a function of recovery. So she's right in that the part of the brain that is processing language, like when we're speaking and coming up with words, is in the left hemisphere of the brain. And oftentimes rhythm and melody and, and music are in other parts of the brain, sometimes right hemisphere, but not we don't know exactly where. And because of the stroke in the left hemisphere, the connections from the left hemisphere, to, uh, the damaged part of the other parts of the brain are disrupted. And that's exactly what your niece also explained correctly, is that part of neuroplasticity is rebuilding the connections, but you don't always get to rebuild connections because you don't get new neurons to fix the problem. You just have to re, you have to do with whatever is left. Mm. And, and in that process, the, re, the neuroplasticity is limited by what is existing uh, connections in the brain. So while singing can help, um, or melody and tune can help speech production. It depends on what the damage is and how those connections can re be, be rebuilt. Yeah. On episode 108, I had interviewed uh, Dr. Michael Merzenich, who in the field of neuroplasticity, I, I, I asked him once, you know, you're considered to be the godfather of neuroplasticity he kind of took that a little bit you know oh well you know not really there's other people that came before me and they did and that's true and that's cool but he led uh, an amazing team of researchers in the 90s that created the first cochlear implant and created a whole bunch of work around proving the possibility of uh, sensory substitution or i think that's the word where they substitute um, for example, the uh, the back of the head and the way that they enter the back of the head with a device to send uh, sound to another part to to the ears via another well to the part that creates hearing through a different mechanism rather than the eardrum the ear canal right mm -hmm. and and when I spoke to him, I specifically asked him about the difficulty of working in that space when for hundreds of years, neuroplasticity wasn't proven to be a thing. And it was kind of almost frowned upon and stroke survivors were told, well, this thing that you have now, now that you're here, you're probably not going to get any better. You're probably not going to walk again. And we still hear that today. There's so many stroke survivors who will get the response from their doctors or well, you probably won't walk again or talk again or do all these things again, only to motivate a lot of stroke survivors to prove them wrong, but some actually potentially to do what the doctors suggested. When you started your work 25 years ago, how did you deal with the space of the, the new resurgence of neuroplasticity and the early stage at which it was being used and being um, potentially not accepted as it is accepted now? How did you deal with that as a 
as a person working with aphasia uh, survivors? That's an excellent question. As I, as a very young researcher in this field, I read all of Mike Berzenek's papers about neuroplasticity, and mm. um, it essentially guided the kind of thinking that I and many other researchers in my space have been trained to think, which is different, as you pointed out. I, I want to say that you've answered all, everything I was going to say was already in your question, but I, I'll phrase it differently. Is most, people, most people were trained to think that neuroplasticity does not happen in adult life. And some of this early work that you were referring to in the 90s, you know, it sort of made us all think, wait a second, there is a way for the adult brain to gain some of that neuroplasticity and and every one of us who worked with stroke survivors knew that they were getting better they were recovering over time so they had to be neuroplasticity in the brain but as you correctly pointed out i want i think i have spent the last 20 to 25 years convincing people researchers clinicians doctors patients that neuroplasticity after a stroke is actually a thing. And this, this myth that there is a plateau after which your brain cannot recover is, is a myth. It's completely false. The brain has the ability to recover, reorganize function with repeated practice, with repeated stimulation and therapy. That's, that's what those early studies showed. It was about you practice something, your brain cells, your neurons learn to re, you know, they, they keep firing and they reorganize and they, and they collect together. And that's exactly what happens after a stroke as well. I would say that today, the progress we've made so far is the, the, the scientific community is completely convinced that neuroplasticity is a thing because we have several tools that are disposable, a disposal like neuro brain imaging that shows that somebody who has had a stroke for 15 years, like yourself too, you've had a stroke for a while, but somebody who's had a stroke can continue to show changes and improvements in their brain. What we have not yet fully convinced are the, uh, you know, the entire the, the 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 neurologists and the funders, the payers, because I think that is when we would have fun, convinced everybody. Because I don't think, I don't think we have to. I don't think I have to ever convince a stroke survivor. They know they have the capacity to recover over time. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. So it's it's really pushing the pushing the work over and over again until we can convince payers that even for someone who is 10, 15 years after a stroke, they have the potential to recover and they should receive the therapy. That's still work that needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. You know what? Because on a couple of episodes ago, so on episode 266, I was interviewed by a gentleman who has an organization here in Australia called, uh, called, um, intensive care at home and what he's done is he's pushed to have people come out of the intensive care ward and transfer the intensive care service to their home where the family is it solves so many problems but in the beginning of his creation of this intensive care at home uh, business where he pr provides intensive care nurses for the patient 
whether they're a stroke survivor or a, it doesn't matter how they become that. Um, the gentleman's name's Patrick Hutzel. Patrick uh, created the situation where they they bring people home and care for them and take away the the burden of the hospital bed um, being taken up by a long term intensive care patient. And then they make it available for another intensive care patient. But what happens is he's constantly fighting with insurance companies because they're talking about cutting the funding because they use words like plateau as a tool to stop the funding. They use that as a word that now that you've reached here, there's nothing we can do for you. What we need to do is cut the funding. You're on your own. Well, the reality is, is I know and stroke survivors know that the plateau is when the funding should be doubled down on. And I'm not saying that it should for everybody. I understand that money is not limitless, but it's when the most focus in rehabilitation needs to begin because the plateau is the sign that if we stop here, we might not pro progress any further from here. Yeah, uh, you're you're four thousand percent right, and I have made it my life and career mission to essentially prove that point as much as I can to change the practice. At least in the U.S., it's it's very very hard, but it, it is what I do in my research is to just keep making that point that there is no plateau. As you said, it's a word that people use to stop funding. So we just need to prove show more and more and more data to make that point yeah i love that i love that there's people like you out there fighting those battles for us it's so amazing that we are so supported it doesn't stroke feels lonely every once in a while you kind of get to this point and go oh my gosh this is so lonely i don't know nobody understands me and um, i'm struggling with my new self my identity all these things and you feel like no one is in your corner sometimes. But the reality is so many researchers that are in our corner, you're a great example of that. And I'm just so grateful for that. And I don't understand why people like you decide that that's what you're going to do for your career. But I know that my niece is that way inclined as well. She wants to go out that direction and support people that she's never met before and help them overcome really difficult neurological conditions and it's like my gosh what a great thing i'm very grateful for that so thank you it is very gratifying uh it's hard work because you every time you think you have the burden to make the proof the bar is higher and then you have to t reach that burden but it is very gratifying um as it you know you're making a difference. I, I do think that at least in the US, as I said, the scientific community does believe that neuroplasticity is a reality for people who have a stroke. And so not only have we spent the time publishing the work, you know, I do my work. I also work with the National Aphasia Association. I'm on their board. We make sure everybody knows that information as well. It's it's about making sure that you do the work and then make people aware of the implications of that work yeah. as well yeah and then the next phase is applications how do you guys work in that space so you have the you create the concept you work out what the implications of that are and then is there an applications phase do you guys get involved there in terms of ask me a question more specifically in terms of so how do you apply the fi the findings from your learnings? For example, you yeah. come up with a concept, you put a whole bunch of research into it, you get some data, and then and then where does the data go? What do you do with the data? Yeah. So so there's two ways we have been doing this. I th I'll give you the more practical application that that um, I think we've really made a difference in. Um, so early on in in my research, and 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 actually, I, I would say over the last 15, 20 years, it has become very apparent that one of the things that seems to matter for people to get better, after, to recover after a stroke, is getting intensive 
sustained repeated therapy. You can get casual, occasional therapy that's not going to help you. And 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 for someone like yourself who's shown so much recovery, I, I'm sure you've seen that when you worked really hard, that's when you saw the gains. And so that scientific data is very clear that to really get the brain to to fire and reorganize, you need lots and lots and lots of practice. So that's scientific data that is is clear that you the more you practice, the more the brain can reorganize. But the reality in Australia and the US is no patient is getting that much therapy. They're getting 10 sessions, 20 sessions of therapy, and then they're told to go home. And, and then what, what is a potential just basically reduces to almost nothing because they're not getting the therapy. So because I knew that was happening, I did create, I, I co-founded a software company called Constant Therapy. That's a, an app you download um, and you can practice therapy at home so that you can get the therapy at home on your phone, on, on your tablet, practicing the amount of repetition and, 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 and 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 sustained improvements that you need. So patients sit at home, they practice five times a week, 60 minutes a day. Um, and, and again, we've taken that data and published that data showing, look, if you actually practice that much, you can show improvements. So that's a that's a, that's something that's actually changed people's ability to to change on their own, to make their own difference. Um, and I, I'm very happy about that because finally, at least in the US, people know about it. When patients get discharged from the hospital, the speech language pathologist tells them, maybe you should practice this when you get home and they go home and they practice. So it's actually made a difference that way. Yeah, that's excellent. So constant therapy is yep. the concept. It's what the organization's called. And what specifically does the app do? How do you use the app. Can you give us a bit of an understanding of that? So if you have trouble, so if if you have if you've had a stroke and you have trouble understanding what people are speaking to you in terms of you know giving you instructions or or they're 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 telling you things or you have trouble reading, the app is organized in terms of every domain, comprehension, reading, spelling. And after you download the app and you try things, um, you try, you sort of test yourself, but in the, in the app, it tells you where your level is. So you uh -huh. have, it says you don't have trouble with understanding, but you have trouble with reading and it places you on a, on a therapy regimen. Um, and then it uses AI and um, to give you therapy exercises every day and you practice. So if you have trouble understanding sentences it'll you keep practicing on the app it'll keep telling you sentences and you have to show how you understand it as you get better the sentences get longer as you get better they become you know passages as you get better they become voicemail messages so it it takes you through the therapy what you have to do is practice it in in the app it's it's very good at speech recognition it, you can speak to it and it will recognize what you're saying Wow. And those are just examples. Yeah. So that's fantastic because 10 years ago, there was nothing available for people to take home after yeah. stroke that they could uh, use on a daily basis to help support their recovery. I remember Michael Merzenich had already back then a uh, brain HQ uh, already set up and you could do the brain training games. And I did a, a fair bit of that. Um, yeah. And brain HQ was uh it was kind of, um, it was the thing that I needed because I could speak, I could communicate yeah. most of the time in my three years of my, my whole drama. Uh, I was able to at least communicate, but cognitively um, it helped me to, to develop my, my focus and my concentration yeah. i think yeah absolutely yeah. and um and it was awesome but it was the only thing that was out there then and i love yes. this version of the stuff that you're doing because it's using ai and um and it's something that a stroke survivor who has aphasia can do and you know what's best yeah. about it is that they don't have to travel if they're in an isolated location or if they're in the middle of nowhere in Australia or in the U S and yeah. they could just download it and do it all from home. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly why we, we, 
developed it. And you know what's been a full circle um, really is that because we have so many people using the app, we're now able to take that data back, analyze it with thousands and thousands of users, and then write the same papers that say, look, this is the kind of practice you need with the hope of changing policy. So in, in my mind, as a researcher, this is coming a full circle because I need this kind of data to convince yes. payers and funders that you have to change policy. So it's much easier to also capture the data where in the past you would have had hundreds of people trying to capture data over many, many years. And then by the time you capture it, 10 years have passed, a decade has passed, and you still haven't made any massive inroads. Whereas now you can also, as part of the recruitment process of, of getting an aphasia, somebody with aphasia to improve their condition they're also providing really relevant and important data yeah hundreds and thousands of data points yeah 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 that's fantastic it's so exciting um so i might have skipped around my conversation it just flows out of my head the way that it comes and uh, when i get excited it just goes all over the place but um tell me about some of the work that you're doing now what are you who are you working with what are your who are you collaborating with tell me a little bit about what's happening right now right so um I, I, you, one of the answers i gave you earlier also was i think i said i have spent a lot of time convincing the scientific and clinical community that the, that the brain can recover and there is neuroplasticity so now i'm focused on trying to um, answer the question, yes, we know there is neuroplasticity. Yes, therapy helps people, but do we know which therapy is perfect for the right person? Can we predict um, for each individual person, what's the right therapy for you? Should you be going to an intensive uh, program for six months, like a boot camp, or should you be going to a club, social club where you get practice? So that's what I'm focused on right now is how can you predict or prescribe which page, which therapy is perfect for the right person. And again, that takes a lot of data, but as I said, um, some of the, the tools we have available to us are brain imaging tools. So we're able to see very, very sophisticated and clear pictures of the brain. What is What part of the brain is damaged? what part of the brain is intact, how are the connections, as you pointed earlier, how are the connections intact and how are they affected? How is the brain connectivity set up? So we're using all that data about the brain to develop models to predict what would be the level of recovery someone's going to show. So it, you know, just simple things like the more the damage a person's brain has and the, the less connections it can make, the less recovery we would we would probably show, but it's a bit more nuanced than that as well, because we're able to use these machine learning models to really make a, a precise guess um, at how people can can expect to recover. So that's it's a prediction, it's a precision medicine prediction work. So that's one area of work that uses a lot of brain imaging data, um, which is hard to do, but. Uh, we've been fortunate to get that data. The other, as I said, is to use AI and machine learning to take people's behavior and see if we could then also make better estimations of how much therapy somebody needs, what's the kind of dosage that somebody needs. Again, to come back to making policy decisions of don't waste somebody's time telling them that they can only get one day a week of therapy. It's never going to change their their brain or they're, they're not good. If they want to go back to work, if they only receive one session of therapy every three weeks, it's a waste of resources and effort. So, so uh, we're trying to, again, use machine learning and AI there to, because we have data now, which we did not have 10 years ago. We really didn't have the kind of data we have now to create these algorithms and predictors that say, here's what to expect. So, so I would say the work that I'm doing right now is a lot about trying to predict the future for for individual patients okay i like that peer into the uh hourglass into the glass into glass ball and see what the future is going to be that's good because that offers hope yeah. and yeah 
if you can predict the positive future, uh, you might not be a hundred percent certain that that's a positive future for that person. But if you can offer hope towards that, they might prove you right. Um, one of the yeah. interesting things is when you hear somebody gets one hour a week of speech therapy, uh, it's almost like the, the system is proving themselves correct in saying that funding this particular thing is not going to get results because look at the data we have people who have gone through the program you know they really didn't get results we shouldn't really fund this we should put our funding somewhere else it feels like the system previously was all about proving that recovery is not possible is it wasn't about going let's get excited about the possibility of recovery it was all about yeah yeah, we need to stop funding this because it's probably not going to happen. Right. But Bill, I, I feel, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time and there have been many years where we thought, is this even going to make a difference? But I, I feel optimistic now for two reasons. I feel like we're in an optimistic phase of this for two reasons. First of all, myself and many other researchers like myself in this field have access to a lot more data, sophisticated data, yeah. good data, and a lot of data. So we are able to make better conclusions um, about what's working and what's not working. That's one thing. The second thing, which I think is very important, and I'm curious to see if you have experienced this in Australia as well, but as you pointed out in the introduction, when you have a stroke and you can't communicate, it's extremely difficult and very socially isolating. So most people who have had a stroke and have aphasia stay home, don't get out, find themselves isolated and lonely and depressed. And until the pandemic, that was just the way those people lived. Mm. And only after the pandemic did people realize if you stay home all the time and don't talk to people and socialize, it can really affect your mental health and it can affect who you are. And so I feel like finally there's some acknowledgement of what it's like for someone to have a stroke and have trouble with communication and socialization um, and why we need to do something about it. That's um, an awareness that's happened, I would say in the last couple of years. And I'm very optimistic for that reason, because I think now the world knows what people with aphasia have faced all these years. Yeah, it is uh, one thing that if, if, well, as far as I'm concerned, if there's one thing that came out of that pandemic is that awareness of the limitations of the way that we go about supporting stroke survivors. For example, it's all done on site it's all done in a hospital it's all done under this particular situation and now we can't so what what have we done have we created a two-year setback for all stroke survivors who are recovering and if we have well we can't do that can we do it another way and this is what i love about the fact that you've got constant therapy available and possible for people to um to use at home because well, now we're not limited by travel yeah. distance, lockdowns, whatever. I hope there's never another lockdown. But in Melbourne, in Australia, we had two years of lockdowns and we were locked down for the majority of that time. I would say that we would have been in some kind of a hard lockdown for at least 12 to 13 months. And then there's a whole bunch of soft lockdowns. But then accessing the medical system was impossible. You couldn't access any part of it for anything. And, mm -hmm. and it felt like what we, what we were doing is creating a situation where we're putting people, setting people back. And from somebody who's naive and doesn't understand anything about epidemiology and doesn't understand anything about diseases and all that kind of stuff, what I would have thought was you guys are trying to save one part of, and this is not a political statement or anything. You're trying to save one part of of the community which i get and is important but what about my community the stroke survivors you know how do we help them get back to life after stroke and be people who are participating in their community and who are 
active and who are paying taxes and who are doing all the things that you guys need people to do so that we're not yeah. uh we're not a complete burden on society so to speak from a medical and cost perspective right so yeah absolutely uh you're offering hope that has never been before and that's why we're and that's why this podcast exists because i didn't have the hope that i needed when i was going through this 12 years ago uh, 10 years ago nearly i needed to find my I needed to create my own uh, ecosystem. Uh, yeah, support. yeah, and yeah. hope, and yeah. I, I might be able to get this, or I might be able to, you know, shrivel up in my in my home and just sort of forget yeah. about life. And that wasn't yeah. an option. Um, yeah. So it's well, it's good it's, for it, you for doing that. It's the the hardest part that people have had to take is really get, because it's not easy at all and so you know really kudos to you for doing this and 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 showing the way for other people i think it was my survival plan i had no choice i had to do something it was either that or just you know shrivel away you know it wasn't gonna be a good outcome if i didn't go this other path so i try and serve as an example of how mm -hmm. people can move forward even if they have more deficits than me or they're worse off in me in some way, like the, we can still move forward. Um, I wanted to ask you about therapists because the therapists that I speak to were frustrated beyond anything when they couldn't have people come to see them for uh, therapy, aphasia therapy or whatever. And it's kind of like they're doing, the therapists are doing their job to help rehabilitate people and get their speech back. But there doesn't seem to be any other part of the scientific community that's actively involved in supporting them to do that. It's kind of like they have a little division of of work that they do. They're speech therapists and they do this work. But although there's the kind of work that you do in the background, there's very little connection between individual therapists and the scientific community. Although I know some speech therapists who are scientists and have and also have um, uh, therapy uh, organizations. So I know there's a little bit of connection, but there seems to be also a disconnect. Now, do you guys work specifically with therapists sharing your findings and then recruiting from there? How do you involve the therapists in your in your work? Right. So, I mean, I, I understand what you're um, saying. It is... Um, it is a complicated suboptimal place where the average therapist, you know, the, the the regular therapist, I shouldn't use either of those, any given therapist in a hospital does not feel the support and the resources necessary because they're fighting so many different battles. Um, in the US, we, we try to make sure that our... Um, our speech and hearing organization that supports most of the therapists are aware of the scientific evidence that um, they need to convince the payers and the funders and their bosses. So the, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association makes it its responsibility to translate the research to information that the clinicians can use. Is it perfect? No, but at least that's their that's part of their responsibilities to make sure that if a clinician who sees a patient says, what, where can I go find help for this patient? They need to just go to this website and look up the evidence and it'll give them research evidence. But again, it's not perfect. And um, it is what I worry about the most is it's not just that the the speech therapist is not aware of neuroplasticity, um, what they can do to harness that for the patient, what's available out there. It's that the patients themselves, the survivors, don't even know that they're going to get, if they stay at it, they're going to get better. They are so, um, this is something that really worries me, and I, I'm, I'm trying to focus some energy on it now, but 
as soon as you have a stroke, there's too much going on in your life. You don't have time to realize what's ahead of you. Uh -huh. um, you're just in the mode of survival and get home, stay alive. And after that, especially for people who have had aphasia, they don't even know what the effect of that aphasia is for a long time. That's why I brought up the social isolation and depression, because they realize they're never going to go back to their job because they can't even sign their name or read instructions. So it's a, it's a huge period of adjustment. And there's very little information, awareness, education that's being given to the survivor and their family to, to, to get through that phase in life and know that there's there's hope beyond that, you know, this is yeah. something that you're going to get better at. So that is where I've spent a lot of my time and effort more recently is making sure that the survivor knows that, yes, it's terrible today. This is two weeks after the stroke. It's, you know, I just need to stay alive. And at six months, yes, I'm still going to get better. I need to keep working at it. I think that is really a message we need to get out wow. as loud as possible. I hear you. I love it. Okay, that's good because we get you guys who have the data into the space where you're talking about the data and the results that you're finding to directly to the end user, which is what's yeah. happening right now. And then yeah. hopefully the end user, if the therapist misses the data or misses the information about what's possible, hopefully the end user can take that information to the therapist and explain to them what they heard or what they know or what they've discovered. Yeah, I mean, just making sure that all the dots are connected because no, yeah. no, no two nodes are, you know, they're, it's it's not a foolproof process right now. It's not perfect yeah. right now. Yeah. So, we, so we do need to arm the stroke survivor with as much hope and information as possible so that they can go and ask their doctor yeah. or their therapist, hey, I heard if I, I heard that if I keep doing therapy, I can get better. What do you think? Um, yes. Yeah. I love it. And, and there's nothing better than a motivated patient going to therapy, really motivated because they have an idea of what's possible and then they can go there and really sort of participate wholeheartedly in the therapy so that they can get the outcomes yeah. and be excited about therapy. <clears throat> I was going to ask you, do you, is there, is there an unmotivated patient, a stroke survivor? Oh, heaps. Yeah. Why is that? Well, that's interesting because I coach some stroke survivors and sometimes I coach their caregivers in conjunction with the stroke survivors. And I feel that some of it is related to, and and when I coach people, they think that I'm coaching them to get through stroke, but really what you're coaching people to do is get through all their limiting beliefs that they've always had in their entire life that are now a real problem because they have a condition that needs a different kind of focus. And sometimes I also find that stroke survivors are unmotivated because the people around them make them unmotivated because they could be surrounded by individuals who would say, oh, you know, why do you want to go to speech therapy? You know, and there's a lot of ill-conceived ideas about the fact that possibly all stroke survivors would want to approach recovery like I do well, not many do because I might try and motive because identity plays a really massive role so for example the first thing that I tell my stroke survivors who I coach to do when they are healing from a brain injury like stroke is stop eating sugar okay so I've nearly died I've, they've had to open my head up to take a blood vessel out so that I can survive. Yeah. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars that's gone into that process. And I don't know the untold millions of dollars that has made it possible for a doctor to put me on a table, put me to sleep and open my head. And when they close my head, I'm still alive at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And then somebody says to me, what you should do is quit sugar to, to help decrease inflammation in your brain and in your body. And the inflammation as it decreases, will in, improve your capacity to recover, heal. It will decrease the level of fatigue that you're experiencing, etc. And when I say to them, you know, quit sugar, they'll come back to me with a thousand reasons why they shouldn't, including you only live once, you know, including, uh, including, but I'm a sweet tooth. 
but how am I going to go to the coffee shop with my friends? Like I won't be able to eat cake. What am I going to do there? So is so there is so many psychosocial barriers, constraints that people go through. Yeah. And yeah. alcohol is one of those massive issues. So when I quit alcohol, all my friendship group, and I quit alcohol basically the day that I had the first brain hemorrhage, but all my friendship group said, uh, well, we're going to go to the pub for a drink. And I'm like, yeah, we'll go. When we get there, it's, what are you having? I'm having water or water. I was like, I'm going to have a beer. Is that all right? I was like, guys, like, you do what yeah. you do and I'll do what I do. And we don't have to do the same thing. And you don't have to feel uncomfortable with me not drinking alcohol. If I drink alcohol, I feel like I'm having another stroke. Why the hell would I drink alcohol? Yeah. And you see, these are, the, these are the kinds of lifestyle changes and, you know, so psychosocial sort of beliefs that you just have to work through so much, even after the stroke, right? Not just before. Um, yeah. It's the biggest the part person. of my recovery is changing my identity and fighting the battles so that I could implement my new identity and nobody else was feeling um, bad about the fact that I had a new identity, but that meant that I lost friends. So if you're going to have a stroke survivor who, who can't speak and is going through all these challenges and they lose friends because uh, they're different or because their friends can't associate with them the right way, or their friends are emotionally naive and don't have the capacity to have empathy for their friend and support their friend it makes such a massive problem and what that could do for the stroke survivor is not make them unmotivated because they chose to be unmotivated but through social isolation depression and mental health issues they could go you know what life's over for me i'm not going down this path and yeah. they come to your ther they come to a therapist for aphasia because insurance is paying for therapy and then what do they do they just get there with there's no hope for me anyway so i'm just going to go through the motions for my family and then once the plateau is reached and they tell me i don't have to come here anymore i won't come here anymore it's yeah you're uh, you're absolutely right and i in my my research i see a lot of patients i've seen people on both sides of exactly what you've described i've seen the folks that are just trying to adjust to their new identity and fighting hard at doing mm. it. Others who have just given up um, as well. Yeah. Look, I would, I would write off my entire friendship group if I had to, to recover. Not because I want to, because I come first. And if they can't come with me, then it's okay. We, we reached our part in life where we enjoyed each other's company and, and if we have to go a separate way, they can go with my blessing. I have no issues about that, but I have to take it. I can't be the same me that got me into the trouble that I was in. Now I had a, a fault in my head that I was born with, but I really created the conditions for that to play yeah. up. I was smoking. I was drinking. I was overworking. I was always angry and stressed out and I was never taking care of myself. So, and, and if I continued to be that guy after my recovery, there's no way you and I would be talking 10 years down the track. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I've really sort of, I draw, I drew the line in the sand. I became a completely different person and my biggest task became re-educating the people around me, the ones that didn't yeah. want to be re-educated, so to speak, they're not around. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. I don't have an issue with that. I have a very different way of seeing things a very yeah. philosophical approach to recovery and life and the rest of it. So I hope that what we're doing here is giving some of the people listening who potentially have aphasia or other conditions related to the stroke, another way to approach life and to think, you know what, screw this. I'm going to, for once in my life, life is short. I'm going to do it my way for once in my life. Yeah. And, and and that is a, I mean, I, I, again, 4,000% agree with everything you're saying. I think, you know, the only thing I would add to that is as, as a scientific community, part of a scientific community that really wants to help, what we are trying to do is give as many tools, uh, you know, in the toolkit yep. 
to empower the the survivor to say, here's the data that says yep. neuroplasticity is a, is not a myth. It, it, it is something that happens. Here's ways for you to get your therapy at home. Here's the way for you to get engaged. So we're just trying to empower the person to say, I'm going to take charge of my life. Yeah. And not, not just give up. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. You're doing some work at the University of Texas at Austin. That's my collaborator. That's right. And yeah. Tell me a little bit about that work. So, so that's a very long standing collaboration I've had now for several, for several years. Um, that is a collaboration with a computer scientist, um, uh, Risto Mikulainen, and he is a really well regarded um, computer researcher who's is really well known for building new machine learning AI models. So he was building AI oh. models before AI became a thing. Like he oh. was one of the main people building those sort of models, a very intelligent self-organizing systems. Um, and so what we are doing in, in that work is we're developing these um, neural network models. This has become a common term now with with other, you know, with all those chat GPT AI, people talk about this a lot, but these are neural network models that essentially try to behave like smart brains. And so he is building the computer algorithms and the, the uh, you know, AI algorithms, and we are feeding him the data and the data could be, is, is people's behavior, their therapy recovery, and that's what the collaboration is, is to use that, to, to take the data, use these very smart, efficient computer algorithms that can be used to predict who's gonna buy the next shoe, but they're actually now going to be used mm -hmm. to decide who's, go you know, who's going to recover and how. Um, and so that's a very, um, you know, th these are the perfect kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations because you can use these, AI models for health and for good. For good instead of evil. Well, yeah, well, that's, it's not evil, but it is, in this case, you can, it actually does make a difference because you can try to understand why there's difference in the data because these computer right. models are good at, at trying to find sense um, in, in a lot of noise. Um, so that's, that's the expertise he brings. And the collaboration is to try to really build sophisticated models of individual patient recoveries yeah so they seem like these guys are a very integral part of constant therapy it seems to be the other part of this tool that you have available for people is that you guys yeah. are doing the data collection they are doing the processing of that data they're using yeah. it for creating the models and then they are um, combining all of that and putting it onto mm -hmm. the platform so that uh, people can access that, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. Even it, yeah. the 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 algorithm in in constant therapy is already very smart because it's it's constantly learning based on the data that's being generated as part of people using the software. The the UT Austin group is taking that data and trying to build different models, better models, mm. so that we truly understand why people are different when they're responding to treatment. Some people get better, some people don't get better, some people, you know, they take a break and they come back and they really, you know, their motivation helps them get better. So that it's trying to really make sense of that so that we create better mo models um, that could eventually be used. Fantastic. How big is your team? At the at Boston University, the team is about twenty people, but the collaboration at UT Austin doesn't count in that because he has his own big team of researchers yeah. Um, as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. I love that Stroke and AI have merged. You know, you hear about these things about AI that you know it's it's going to do. It's so fantastic that AI and stroke support and aphasia support has merged and become a thing. Yeah. And now yes. we're benefiting from that. You know, our community is so desperately in need of um, real solutions and real support, you know, that's cost effective and that's easy to access. And um, that may, means that we don't have to travel 
one of the hardest things for me was traveling to my three appointments a week, you know, and finding three hours a day, just getting to and from and being at my appointments. And at some point it becomes really difficult, especially with a stroke brain to navigate that and have that. And it keeps you in a way, even though you're going to therapy, it keeps you out of the community because yeah. you don't have as much time for your community and yeah. for the things that you want to get back to doing because you have to be in therapy so there's a real there's a real kind of challenge in navigating that whole process so um yeah. if i if i had therapy available to me at home i would have taken it up immediately like okay. i did and and i'm a i'm a very optimistic person bill so I, I do think that something good has come out of all this pandemic and i'm sure this is true in yep. australia as well but even in the u.s it has become clear that you have to make it make home-based health, home health available through video conference, telepractice, whatever that is, you have to make it available. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a silver lining that's come out of this as well. Yeah. Likewise, in this, you know, in this rage of AI that's affecting everything in our life, again, the positive silver lining for all this with, in, with stroke and health and recovery is, um, in the past, we would be very scared to say no two people are alike, so I can't help you because you're so different from the person I saw before. I don't know what to do with you. Um, but now we can say, well, you're different, and our data can can model that differences, and and that is another huge technological scientific leap that's happened that allows us to say you might be different from the next person that walks in. We can help you. Whereas in the past, we would say, oh, we don't know what to do with this. Yeah. Everybody has to look exactly the same. Only then yeah. we can tell you what's going on. Yes. So there's nuance now. There's individual applications rather than one size fits all. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Now, you know, some of my listeners and um, community, the stroke survivor community, some of those guys, they're going to go into parts of life, you know, maybe even me, you know, with uh and dementia and alzheimer's might be an issue now this is what's cool about what you're doing is, is that it's not just applicable to one aspect of community you're specifically working with stroke survivors but have you done work with people experiencing alzheimer's or dementia and if not is this like easily just like applicable to them or do they have more unique things that you need to take into consideration yeah, that's a great question, Bill. Um, the there's two parts of this. Um, a lot of until very recently, I would say five years ago, if somebody had was diagnosed with dementia, it was even worse than a diagnosis of stroke because mm. people would say, "Go home and die," because we can't help you. This is you're just going to get worse, and after a while, you're not going to remember anything. That is not what's happening now. As you know, there are drugs that have been approved for dementia, and there's quite a bit of scientific evidence showing that people who are diagnosed with dementia, if they practice therapy, they do um, you know, focus therapy, memory therapy, they actually can maintain their skills for a while. So in that context, whatever works for in, in, a, in the context of something like constant therapy or any other therapy, those exercises, like you mentioned, Brain HQ, they are working on attention and memory and focus. They will help people with dementia as well, as long as they can practice it fairly regularly. So that's a good, that's a piece of good news. Um, and then the second piece that I want to say is we are extending all our work into dementia as well, because what we have understood, and you mentioned this earlier in, in your podcast is, that it's not just the stroke that affects someone's brain, overall health affects the brain, what you eat, um, what your other lifestyle choices are all affect not just your body, but your brain as well. So what we are doing and other people have found is that in addition to what the stroke has done to the brain, there are other things in the brain, overall brain health that also predicts whether somebody is going to get better or worse in time. And that's where some people with a stroke will just get better and you know they'll live fine. Other people with stroke are already at risk for other things because of their health or their cardiovascular risk factors. 
And they're actually at risk for decline because their overall brain health is not as strong. So we are, so myself, you know, our group and other groups are starting to look at that now, because again, you can look into the future and you can say with this sort of a overall brain health profile, you know, you may not be as, as, as high or your prognosis may not be as good as someone who has a different brain health profile. Okay, that's really good for the first time. So what we're doing is going into therapy, not only with this is going to help you speak better, but also this as well, this other thing that if you pay attention to is going to help you speak better, as well as the therapy is also going to help you speak better. They're going yeah, to work so together. We're to, right, we're trying to understand all those factors. Um, and, uh, and, and there seems to be this continuum of what the brain looks like when someone just has a stroke and what the brain looks like when someone has dementia and there's something that's changing in the brain in that process and we are trying to understand how to document that so we can exactly show where people have a potential for recovery or where they're at a higher risk um there's these are not isolated conditions anymore they're all you know different kinds of the same problem that the brain's going through yeah you know, this in this podcast series, you know, we're up to, I think your episode will be something like 267, 8, 9, somewhere there, um, is a little bit of a research project for me. It's a whole bunch of data and I see some patterns that emerge. And recently, one of the uh, people who hasn't been on the podcast, who's doing it quite tough, who I've kind of supported a little bit via um, email, uh, has told me, you know, where are all of the the stories from stroke survivors coming onto your podcast who are doing it really tough with, for example, a spouse that's making recovery hard. So you spoke earlier about, about um, people who are not motivated to recover. This particular gentleman has a spouse who is separated from who is really making his life difficult and that's getting in the way of his stroke recovery. And he was saying he was saying this out of frustration and anger because of the situation that he was in amongst all the other situations that he's um, in with his health. And what I realized when he said that um, was that I don't pick my stroke survivors who actually come on the podcast. They pick me. I ask some of them if they want to be on the podcast and some of them say no. And some of them say, yes, there's aphasia, uh, people with aphasia that have been on the podcast, even though most, even though that's not a, f a very fluid and quick episode to listen to, right? But with editing, you can get rid of the pauses and the stops, and we can make it cohesive, and it and it, it sounds like a very decent conversation, and it shares the story of somebody experiencing aphasia and recovering from it and going after recovery. Now there's other people who won't come on the podcast and they'll specifically know the reason is, is because I have aphasia. And that says to me something about the fact that the people who do come on the podcast, whether they have aphasia or not, are having a better stroke recovery than the people who choose not to come on the podcast because they are, they are talking about it. They are sharing so other people can learn and help them and help other people. They are getting it off their chest. They are getting their story, their, their turmoil, their condition all off their chest. You know, they are sharing it with the world, not just this gets downloaded in 60 countries. It's not just me they're talking to. They're sharing it with the world. And I've seen this pattern that the kind of person that comes on this podcast is having this is not a very scientific word, a better stroke recovery than the person who's not coming on the podcast. So it's just something about getting involved and participating and being active and making it potentially about somebody else uh, is supporting recovery and is supporting the work that your therapists are doing, that you guys are doing. It's all together. You know, we're all a yeah. We're all an important piece of the puzzle. We all got to work together to solve problems for us and then for the people coming after us. 
Yes, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And I think the best you and I can do is empower the people who are brave enough to come mm. um, to your podcast, get out in the world and try um, everything they can try every day, even though it's hard for them, and 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 then motivate the folks who need that little bit push to get out of their house. Um, they're they're the ones who need the most help because it's it's much harder for them to get out of their house. You know, I mean, house like get out of yeah. their shell, yeah, and yeah. and try. Yeah, and that's what you and I can do is to to give them different ways to feel motivated yeah. and, and try every day. Yeah, I love it. Uh, as we wrap up, I'd love to ask you if there's one takeaway from this whole discussion that we've had that you want the people listening, caregivers, uh, therapists, uh, stroke survivors, if there's one thing that they could take away from this episode, is there something that you could share? Bill, I want every one of your listeners who's had a stroke to know that the worst part of the stroke is having the stroke. And after that, the brain has this phenomenal ability to recover, reorganize, neuroplasticity happens in the brain. And there is no time limit for that. Um, they, you, have to, you have to try, try different ways because not, not one approach will work all the time. You may have to try something and it doesn't work, stop, come back, try something else, but don't give up because every bit of the scientific data suggests that your brain can take this on um, and, and keep working on the recovery. Dr. Kieran, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great to chat with you. It was great to talk to you. Thanks, Phil. Well, thank you for joining me on today's episode. It was a really cool conversation. I hope you got a lot out of it. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Thanks to all those people who have already left the review. Uh, it means the world to me, and you are helping others in need of this type of content to find it easier, and that is making a difference in their recovery and it's making their recovery just a little bit better. If you haven't left a review and you would like to, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you are watching on YouTube, comment below the video, like this episode, and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show. And thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.